What's going on out there, y'all? My name is James K. Holder II. Some of you may know me as Sir James II, and I'd like to welcome you to Not On My Watch. This is episode two. It is February 1st, Black History Month, the first day, and I want to just welcome you all in, invite you to like, share, and comment as much as possible. I invite you to retweet and repeat. We definitely want to share this message and get the word out that this is the resistance. Not On My Watch is about empowering those who fall in the categories that are typically marginalized and often will face challenges in the coming years with the, with the way things are going in America. So when we see racism, when we see fat phobia, when we see ableism, when we see transphobia, anything like that, sexism, we're going to say not on my watch. And that's what this program is really about. It's about providing a platform, providing a message and a voice uh, that is progressive. And that, what we mean by progressive is that everybody has a seat at this table. So again, I'd like to welcome you to episode two. Um, and we will be meeting weekly every Wednesday at noon. And so I invite you to join me at holderstudio.com where you'll get updates. You'll also see um, past projects that I've done over the time. I've been doing this for a while. This is a new format for me. So again, I invite you to bear with me as I have my trusty notes in front of me. Some of what we're doing here, I'll be using my phone <laughs> to pull up content to comment on. And so I really, really appreciate uh, your support with this. Um, like I said, happy Black History Month. Uh, this is something that is very dear to me. Uh, it's very important to our country. And I honestly believe that if we had been more focused on African American history and heritage and contributions to this country, we might have seen a different result. We might see different things in the way that people are treated in this country. I'm um, just understanding that there is a need to focus 28 days, shortest day of the year, on the contributions of black people and movements and um, accomplishments. And that is about instilling a sense of appreciation in contributions of black people to this country. And it's also inspired other uh, significant times uh, af thereafter. So we want to definitely cherish that. So stay tuned to the end of this uh, program. There will be a special segment every week uh, that we do this in February where we'll focus on one person um, or one movement or one aspect of American history that's relevant to today's times. And I think that's a really important thing um, to do. I also invite you to follow my personal Instagram account. And now, mind you, it can get a little ratchet on there. It, that is my personal account, so don't expect too much. But it's at JKH2, just like my Twitter is at JKH2. And there, I will be doing a daily um, Living Black History Month uh, celebration. So every day of the week, not on the weekend, take those off, um, I will be posting some person to celebrate uh, African American heritage and those contributions. And it was something that was really good and really empowering last year. And it was uh, pretty successful. There were a lot of people this year who really, you know, came back to me and just said they wanted to make sure I did it again. Um, for me, the most, one of the most moving things was that uh, months after having completed the, the series, um, one of the featured artists or featured uh, profiles was Prince. And as we all know, Prince's untimely death came later on in that year, in 2016. And so it really was sort of a, a reminder that we need to cherish people while, they, while they're still with us. And we need to be in the, we need to be more cognizant about giving people their roses while they're around to smell them. And so that's what the focus is with that. So in combination with this, uh, you'll also be seeing that on my personal Instagram account. So. Let's get into it. Um, there is not much to focus on today. <laughs> There's two major things. Last time I talked to you was Inauguration Day. Uh, since then, a lot of uh, mayhem and, and foolishness has unfolded. As I said before, it's February 1st. Trump's been in office for just a mere 12 days. And for those of you who are keeping track as I am, that means we have 1,449 days left. <laughs> in a Trump presidency for his first term. Uh, hopefully, at the end of that four years, uh, we will be able to, 
take a different direction in the country. Uh, maybe if we're lucky, if God has other plans, uh, we won't have to wait out that entire timeline. And I do want to quickly focus, not quickly, I want to seriously focus on the fact that I, we do not wish President Trump harm um, here. What we want to do is really hold him accountable. We really are the resistance, and that's fine, but we don't wish death on anybody. So the, the, the key thing is that I want President Trump to be protected. I want this man to be safe, but I also want American citizens and their rights to be safeguarded from him. And so one thing that has been very interesting in the almost two weeks that this man has been in office, um, much of what his criticism was of Barack Obama was that he was a dictator, that he took way too much executive action and way too much force, way too much um, presidential leverage um, in taking away the, the rights of the people. And, you know, even in his inauguration speech, which none of us really watched, but I caught clips, talked about um, now, today, the power is back to the people. So let us talk about Mr. Trump's executive orders. Uh, this will be a special segment today. It is basically just going to be us documenting everything that he's doing that is just far reaching and, and really overbearing on his power to uh, encumber the American people with his will. So I'm just going to go in chronological order here. This started on day one. Uh, we're talking about Proclamation 9570. Uh, many of you watched the unfolding of the inauguration, not even so much the, the ceremony itself, but there was decidedly less enthusiasm, less enthusiasm about a Trump presidency than with Barack Obama that we saw in 2009's inauguration or in 2013. And so there were huge gaps in the, the crowds at the mall. I mean, if you could call them crowds, there really weren't many people there. I mean, some estimates had it at a quarter of a million people, which to put things in perspective, Barack Obama had about um, seven times that many people at his inauguration in 2009. And so <laughs> since then, what you saw was a lot of sort of uh, gaslighting. There was just a lot of lying from the Trump administration. Ch Sean Spicer held a press conference where he discussed specifically the, um, the executive, the the crowds and how big the crowds were and how, oh, well, the, the ground was covered and that was the first time that the ground was covered in the mall to protect the, the, the grass. And so it looked like there were fewer people there. I mean, really, really, really just significant just lying about why there was no one there celebrating this man's inauguration. And apparently it bugged um, T asterisk so much that he had to sign his first executive order um, Naming it the Na oh, wait. National Day of Patriotic Devotion. Now, I don't know how many of you were devoted to patriotism on the day that Donald Trump was elected, or inaugurated rather, but that, that was not really a big day to celebrate. As you can see, on that Friday, you had about a quarter of a million people in D.C. The next day, you had about three times as many people at the Women's March, which was a huge success. Uh, globally, actually, there was participation in every major city, some small counties and towns, there was uh, participation globally. So that was a huge uh, success and a big statement against what the Trump administration, administration stands for when it comes to women's rights, uh, reproductive rights, and, and just decorum within the White House itself. Um, there... That was just kind of one of the more shallow executive orders, but seriously, moving forward, there were more. Um, there's Executive Order 13765, which is um, minimizing the economic burden of the Affordable Care Act um, pending re repeal. So, as we know, the, the GOP ran, Trump ran, all of the Republican uh, seats ran um, on this idea of repealing Obamacare because it was so terrible for the American people. Um, and it really hasn't gone too well for them because they don't have a replacement set up. Uh, they've been actively trying to repeal this legislation for about, what, what would you say, six years? Six or seven years. And so to have that much time elapsed and you not come up with any 
reasonable alternative to this program that you say is so terrible. It's really just, um, it's really just somewhat reckless and to be moving forward so quickly on it. But uh, this was one of those sort of puff pieces. He just kind of put some stuff out there saying, to, to make it seem like he was tough on this bill, but they really don't have a replacement in mind. So we don't know exactly where that one's gonna lead. Um, one other uh, executive order, the withdrawal of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This is TPP. Many people on the left and right were very adamant about um, kneecapping Barack Obama's trademark trade deal. Um, this was uh, this is a really convoluted piece of legislation. I'm not going to lie; it wasn't all good, it wasn't all bad, but it came highly politicized and it was really controversial to the point where it was one of the things that led to um, Hillary Clinton's demise, I would say, um, in her uh, run for the White House. Now. One thing that was particularly interesting was that Trump discussed trade deals in general. When we talked about uh, his, his run and, and everything, he was able to sort of blame uh, the Clinton administration of uh, the 90s with, you know, the uh, NAFTA and other, you know, trade deals that ultimately crushed the American economy. Now, mind you, Bill Clinton and President Barack Obama both presided over two of the largest economic expansions in America's history, um, including job growth. So there were specific complaints from blue collar white workers. Um, we're talking about working class families, working families, white working class, however you want to put that. But that was the specific group that seemed to be the most um, demoralized by trade deals in general. So Bernie Sanders and um, now Donald Trump both uh, supported uh, the repeal of, of TPP or, or blocking of TPP as a trade deal. Now, the interesting thing about it is that we really don't know what the motivations of these two gentlemen were because they both had seemed to have a beef with Barack Obama anyway. And so it might have just been part to just take him down, might have been to just make him less effective, might to just be a slap in the face um, to him. But Bernie Sanders certainly praised Trump for his, his blocking of TPP, which I thought was particularly unnerving because TPP was already pretty much dead on arrival. Had Hillary Clinton assumed office, she had pretty much said that, you know, and you can take her at her word or not take her at her word, it doesn't really matter now, that she wasn't going to move forward with TPP. It was something that she supported as uh, a member of President Barack Obama's cabinet, but that was her job as Secretary of State at the time to support that legislation and, and help uh, foster that into fruition. So now that that's sort of definitively killed um, by the Trump administration, uh, it was interesting to see Bernie Sanders praise that. And I really don't support that, Bernie. You got to calm down on kissing ass, okay? We got to stop a little bit of the brown nosing because it's a little too early to give him so much credit. And sadly, you see a lot of people who are willing to just kind of flee right over to Trump's winning column. Like they will really just follow Bernie Sanders and what he supports. And that's a bit dangerous. And I think that contributed to a lot of, um, a lot of what we saw in the lack of support on the, on the left in this election. So Bernie, I want to encourage you to watch that because it's just a little bit too, you're just a little bit too excited to support what Donald Trump is doing. Um, next, the Mexico City policy. This is one of those things I would advise you to kind of look at all of these. There's a pretty exhaustive list here, so I'm going to kind of breeze through these. But the Mexico City policy is sort of an attack on, um, not sort of, it is, it is an attack on the reproductive rights of um, women. It basically states that what uh, the U.S. government is able to do is block foreign aid from the United States to any sort of health organization um, within a country that's foreign that supports um, family planning initiatives. So if a, if a, if a government supports um, abortion rights, if it supports um, even birth control um, as a means of, you know, women having the choice, then this, this uh, executive order prevents uh, the United States from administering like foreign aid to assuaging developing health problems around the developing world. And so that is kind of dangerous because it's a power grab and it's a way to sort of force um, the rights 
policies in America that restrict women's abortion rights or, you know, any reproductive rights of women um, to even have access to birth control um, on other countries. And it puts pressure on those governments to now restrict the rights of women so that they may get foreign aid to prevent uh, sort of communicable diseases or spreads or epidemics or anything that might impact their um, communities. So that's something that is uh, really uh, wide-ranging. And it's not brand new. This was a Reagan-era policy that was just sort of uh, put back into place. But again, I'd like to think that we've evolved a bit as a country uh, since those times, but maybe we haven't. Uh, particularly large slap in the face to the Green Party. Thank you, Jill Stein. Um, sick Dr. Jill Stein. Um, we <laughs> One thing I found was particularly interesting was that the, you had all these people in the Green Party who were out protesting and taking their private jets to uh, North Dakota to protest uh, and, and no, no DAPL and Keystone XL and all those other initiatives that were going on uh, with the uh, because we wanted to protect the water of the sacred lands of Native Americans. And of course, that's something that we want to support as a part of the progressive agenda. Um, I don't want to minimize that at all. But you kind of, you know missed the mark because all of those people who were so passionate about that issue ended up supporting Jill Stein for president in a way and not supporting Hillary Clinton, who, if elected, would have been able to prevent, to, to keep the same executive orders that Barack Obama had instilled in stopping the uh, construction on the uh, North Dakota Access Pipeline and also Keystone XL. What we did instead, by having this far-left movement, was split the party, empowered Trump. He gets in, and of course we all find out now that Trump is an investor, a major owner, in the pipeline. And so, sure enough, within his first week, he has an executive order to resume construction on both of those pipelines. That is sort of, that's, it's just one of those things that you have to learn and realize that you have to be able to make alliances with people that you don't necessarily agree with all the time. That's what coalition building is. It's not necessarily about, I like you, I like everything that you stand for, but I support enough of what you do and I'm counting on you to do these things that I believe in and support. And that is where we missed the mark on the progressive edge. And that was a huge slap in the face to Native communities and just the environment and the progressive agenda in terms of uh, water concerns um, as a whole. Additional executive order um, was about the, the border wall. So Trump's monument to himself, which there are astronomical uh, estimates, and none of which will really be appropriate at this point. Um, one thing about construction projects is they always tend to be over budget. They always tend to be um, late on delivery. And so we can expect that whatever they give us as an estimate for the cost of this project, that it will be um, exceeded um, by tremendous margins. You can also expect that because Trump is a builder and has nothing but connections in that industry, that there will be significant kickbacks back to his organizations. Um, that, you know, do I have proof of those things? No, but we also haven't seen his tax returns to know who he's in bed with financially and what those, the ramifications are of those decisions of who's getting these contracts. He has done an exceptional job in protecting himself and uh, putting us at a really significant risk of being exposed to any of his own conflicts. And so we really have to be mindful of that moving forward. Um, one of the things that this uh, order calls for is 5,000 border agents, um, 5,000 additional border agents. And so with net immigration at zero um, over the past, what, two years, it really is uh, one of those things you have to wonder why there's so much resources and attention being given to this issue, unless it's about racism and unless it's about um, controlling the American population and really, really empowering um, essentially the white male voice and the power of the white male vote. On January 27th, um, he signed an executive order protecting the, nas the nation from foreign terrorists entry into the United States. Now, many of you followed this over the weekend. What this was, was basically up until the point where people were flying into this country on planes, were landing and being detained and told that they didn't have the right to come to this country, people who had green cards to the United States, people who were legally allowed citizens, people, I mean, not so much citizens, but people 
who had the legal right to be here were being detained and in some cases deported from our, our land. And, and that is something that we sort of were, we knew what the potential to happen. We knew it was something that was unconstitutional. And thankfully, um, the ACLU jumped right into um, motion. Many of the Democratic senators uh, were present at the airports uh, supporting uh, people who were the victims of this executive order. This overreach, really. Um, but we're talking about Cory Booker, um, John Lewis, my, one of my personal favorites, and many others, uh, Elizabeth Warren, were all at their respective airports and uh, were, really did a good job in championing the cause and making sure that as uh, the laws and judges, uh, there was a judgment that was issued where it was said that this was unconstitutional and that they would have to let those people in. And so despite the fact that many of the border agents were still um, sort of ignoring the court order and following the executive order, which is illegal. Um, many of the, the senators did stay there and other you know, representatives uh, to support those who were in need at that time. And it's something that we're still fighting, but to just name you the list, um, Iran, Iraq, Libya, uh, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen were all on the list of uh, no go. So those people coming from those countries um, essentially are banned. It is the Muslim ban. They are banning people from coming, entering from those countries. Uh, coincidentally, or not so much coincidentally, there are a lot of conflicts in these areas. So preventing people from being able to leave uh, just gives it much more tension in, the, in that space. And it's also interesting to point out that in countries like Egypt and Saudi Arabia, where Trump has business dealings, those particular um, countries are not banned, even though they have primarily Muslim um, populations. So that's another thing to watch. We really have to be mindful of these things. Now it's time for Trump's Twitter. And you know, this is uh, one of my favorite segments of this show, where I just go on and look at what this man has been talking about throughout the day. There's been some interesting, interesting posts over the last couple of days, but this one kind of stuck out to me as just really needing to be discussed. Um, <laughs> and this is uh, a direct quote. This is from uh, January 31st at 6.21 a.m. So it's nice to know that he's not tweeting at 3 a.m. so much anymore, but 6.21 a.m. is still a little early to be tweeting. Again, still from his personal account, at Real Donald Trump, which I do not follow, nor do I follow at POTUS. Um, every time I want to look at his page, I just kind of have to look it up, and that's fine because I don't want to give him the follow. Um, it says, and I quote, Nancy Pelosi and fake tears... Chuck Schumer held a rally at the steps of the Supreme Court and Mike did not work. A mess. Just like Dem Party. So we have this catty, uh, some would say queeny tweet from Donald Trump. And it, I think it's really interesting, right, that this man is sort of, first of all, picking on Chuck Schumer for, for tearing up. And, and you can look into that, but that was like a whole thing around what we just talked about, the Muslim ban. Um, and his response to that was very emotional. And I, and I applaud him for his emotion, his sincerity on the issue. Um, but for him to pick on anybody for a mic not working, when we all know full well in the first debate against Hillary Clinton, well, what did we hear from him? He got clobbered by her, first of all. And then he goes on to say that, oh, the mic wasn't working. We hear every word this man is saying. We hear every breath, every wincing, that, that, that huge, you know, some, <laughs> Paul, what was it, uh, Howard Dean had something to say about, oh, I think he's on drugs. And there were a lot of, there's a lot of speculation. Many people were saying that Trump might have been on cocaine that night because of the heavy breathing, but that's not even over there. And I'm just saying what many people are saying. I have no source on that. Um, but they were meeting on the steps of the Supreme Court because... As it would be, last night, Donald Trump announced that he was nominating Judge Neil Gorsuch, a.k.a. Antonin Scalia Jr., to be the, his first nomination for the Supreme Court. And um, this is a very significant move on his part. This is a, uh, I have not done so much research into this gentleman, but he's a judge already, so he can't be so bad. He can't be so unqualified. He's not... Um, to the level of a, a, a Jeff Sessions. But we do know that he is pro-police, um, he is anti-abortion, and he's 49 years old. Which, the disturbing thing about that is that this man would have a lifetime appointment. And with the way things are going now, we could expect him to live for 
the, at least the next eight presidential elections. So this is the influence. If this man is appointed, um, his influence will exist and be present on the Supreme Court um, for at least 30 years, approximately. And so that is something that is very significant. We don't know where uh, the approach is going to go with this one. Uh, many progressives are just calling for just a complete blockade by the Democrats. Um, in that event, the Republicans will be able to kind of overrule that if they chose to do so. Um, but we'll see. We, we don't know where this is going to go from here. Uh, everyone knows about the, the obstruction of Merrick Garland's appointment. Um, so, of course, <laughs> no one really expected Trump to retroactively re appoint or uh, nominate Merrick Garland, but this is a far cry from that. And Trump has said in the past that he would, he would support someone in the vein of Antonin Scalia, and this is what he has done in this um, nomination. So first, SCOTUS appointment of hopefully not too many. Uh, we're just hoping that the progressives in that court can hang on for as long as possible, and maybe we won't, be, we won't go back too far with this whole thing. Um, Next, I want to bring up uh, another champion, and we, we, we talked about it last week, but Maxine Waters, Representative Maxine Waters of California, is really a stellar shining star in the resist movement, and this is what we're talking about. Today, rather yesterday, she held a press conference um, about uh, bringing an investigation against Donald Trump and his connections to Russia. So, in this... Um, in this bill, which calls for a thorough investigation, she really just highlights key people that are in Trump's administration, Trump's board, Trump's uh, organization, uh, and his administration moving forward, if they are appointed, that are, have really undeniable ties to Russia that need to be looked into. So um, on the list, we have Paul Manafort, who we know is Trump's former campaign manager, his ties to uh, dealings in Russia and that region um, from years past that actually sort of disqualified him from continuing as Trump's uh, campaign manager until Corey Lewandowski then took over and then you had um, Kellyanne Conrad's take over and so that was that was that we knew Paul Manafort was sort of like unacceptable in that space um, we have Roger Stone who is of course linked to Julian Assange who's responsible for all the hacks against the DNC we have um, Michael Flynn uh, who really um, has has all these connections, and he's been you know paid to do events and all kind of stuff in Moscow. We know that we have uh, Willow Ross, and uh, he is Trump's nominee for Secretary of Commerce. And the significance of that is that he had connections, and he's worked with uh, like Russian oligarchs. And lastly, Rex Tillerson. Um, who is the, I think he was like the CEO of ExxonMobil. And under, in that position, he actually signed up on a deal with Vladimir Putin um, in Russia. This was in 2011 to do some drilling between the Arctic and Russia. So there was a whole deal thing going on there. Um, but that was, that deal got a sanction put on it in 2014. So it was stopped. And we know that Trump is poised to lift all the Russian sanctions. Um, and if Rex Tillerson, who is Trump's nominee for Secretary of State, takes office, if he's confirmed, um, then he'll be in position to, again, benefit Vladimir Putin. So there are just so many links to Trump's organization, Trump's campaign, Trump's um, administration, um, and that seemed to benefit uh, very materially Vladimir Putin. And so those things are what uh, Representative Maxine Waters is looking in to be uh, investigated. So I definitely want to give her a profound kudos and a thank you um, for those things. And as I mentioned in the beginning of the program, it is Black History Month, February 1st, and we want to celebrate that by remembering those who came before us. And, and there is no better way to beginning, begin the celebration of this month and this uh, journey with the beginning of the American story and Crispus Attucks. Um, many of you know of uh, the story of Crispus Attucks born. Um, he was of uh, African descent and also a Native American, um, born in 1723 in Massachusetts. And uh, he died on March 5th, 1770. The significance of that is that Crispus Attucks was amongst about five 
um, patriots, five Americans, um, who were, well, literally, this is way, way, way back in the day before, like, there was, like, a Revolutionary War and everything. This was actually the beginning of the Re Revolutionary War. Uh, the Boston Massacre occurred um, at this time, and this was the first man killed in that assault. Um, this is where you had, you know, the British uh, had been really coming in and kind of, they were habitual line steppers to begin with. They was already like all over the place and doing too much um, in the colonies. And, and the, the, we were getting, I say we, were getting like frustrated with that situation. But you had to the point where it got, it came to a head just on a social outing where one of the British soldiers uh, who was there to kind of, uh, I guess, keep an eye on the, the colonists who were getting like unruly, um, sort of ducked out on a, what the legend has it, ducked out on a, um, a barber's bill, like they just kind of left the barbershop, didn't pay, and um, they, there was a confrontation. And among that, those who confronted that soldier were uh, Crispus Attucks and about five other gentlemen. Uh, there was a, a, a confrontation, shots broke out. Crispus Attucks was shot with two bullets. Um, he was the first person who died in that massacre, where uh, about, I think, 11 people were injured, or 11 people were wounded, Five of those uh, eventually succumbed to the injuries, and Crispus Attucks was the first. So the significance of Crispus Attucks is that they're all throughout my existence in the United States, and I've, I've seen you know, different movements and different times with, with black America and how we identify. And this particular time, we've seen a lot of demoralization within the African American community. You've seen a lot of people sort of step back and be divested from uh, the American idea. And I think what Crispus Attucks serves as an example is that Chris, black people are the American idea. Black people are the, the foundation of this country. Because despite the fact that this man was born into slavery, um, escaped slavery, if my notes would have it correct, I mean, he, he escaped slavery around the age of 25 and became a sailor, and uh, he would, he would uh, man ships and, and work on uh, docks and, and ports you know, for about 20 years. Uh, he had an assumed name. This is why a lot of what we know about this man is not, com not concrete. You know? And one thing we know about black history is that if, if there's an assumption that somebody's black at all, we know that we, they identify as black because every so often you will get this whitewashing. You'll get... Uh, uh, a white actor playing Michael Jackson in a movie. You'll get, you know, you'll get things that happen. You'll get uh, Elizabeth Taylor playing uh, Cleopatra. That begin to sort of tell you that these heroes and these legends were actually not, in fact, black when we know that they were. And so, Christmas Addicts, though of late, you know, the details of his birth and his heritage are, you know, we're st we're still unknown because we don't have all the documentation there. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that he was either a freed slave or a runaway slave. Again, we don't really know, but what we do know is that this black man uh, essentially laid his life on the line to protect the American idea, and therefore he instilled and ensured our inheritance to that legacy. And what, as black people, what we can take from his example is that we don't need to shy away from the American dream. We should redefine it for what our purposes are, because we can't necessarily fall in line with what um, the, the, the white picket fence idea. But there are different things that we can demand from this country that we can expect and that we can um, hold this country accountable to. And I think we should use this example of sacrifice, um, selflessness, um, patriotism as a way that we, can, we as black people, African Americans, people of color, Muslims, immigrants, um, everyone can take pride in the American ideal without falling into the pattern of conflation with patriotism and white supremacy, which is what we tend to see in American history. So I want to encourage everyone to take a further look into the, the legacy and the life of Christmas Attucks, um, the first soul to bleed blood for the American idea, the first death of the, uh, the first casualty of the American Revolutionary War. And take that with you and take that seriously because that in and of itself says quite plainly that Americans are diverse people. Americans of native descent, Americans of African descent deserve um, 
equal protection under the law because we have contributed and sacrificed to the building of this country. And I think he's a very clear example. So um, we will feature other stories, other people, other movements um, throughout the month. But I wanted to definitely start out there and just let people know that you, you have um, a commitment. You have a place here. And you have a seat at this table. With that, I'd like to invite you to join us back here next Wednesday at noon at Holder Studio. I invite you to follow me on Twitter. My account is uh, Sir James the Second, but the handle is at JKH2, um, and also on Instagram, similarly at JKH2. And remind you to relax, relate, and resist. Thank you. See you next time. Too Thank you.